Okay, good evening, John. Um, it's great to be able to talk to you on the uh, Western Bar Association webinar. As um, uh, David pointed out, it's it's slightly different format. It's more of a fireside chat. Um, and it really revolves around your your book, Tornado in the Eye of the Storm, which I, I must say is a, is a cracking read. Um, I've been ex, ex-Navy. Um, I, I, I get it. I, I know about it. And you and I joined the, the military in the early 80s when it was the height of the Cold War. Um, and what David said beforehand, though, is although this is a, a, a First World War Forum, the Western Front Association talking it, I think much of the things we, we will hopefully be talking about tonight, they're enduring themes of warfare. They, it doesn't matter where, you know, when in history you actually cover them. There are there are things that affect people. Technology changes, but the the enduring realities of war, I think, uh, remain consistent. So, um, so I, as I say, we've got a, a great war focused audience. So I think we've got to be a little bit careful with the, the um, uh, us getting back into military speak and, and everything else. So we need to keep it at uh, at that level. But but as I say, um, uh, could you start off really at the beginning by situating us in what was going on in the early 80s? You and I joining up, the height of the Cold War. What drew you into the Air Force? What, you know, what, what sort of training you went through and how you ended up on the T- Tornado GR-1 uh, ground attack, uh, attack aircraft? Cheers, uh, Rocky. I think just to kind of go on from what you said there, <clears throat> yes, this is not, you know, we're not going to be talking about the Western Front and World War One. But I'm a great believer. You know, I, I did 16 years in the Air Force and I've, uh, I was privileged during my time to, to meet a lot of uh, World War II veterans, hundreds, thousands of World War II veterans, and very privileged on a, on a handful of occasions to meet some, uh, some of the World War I veterans. And for me, uh, what came out is when I sat with them, so, you know, I've sat with a very young serviceman uh, in, in his or her 20s, me, now in my late 50s, uh, World War I, stroke, World War II veteran in their 90s. And what comes across is that we are the same people. We have the same story to tell. We have the same uh, experiences of battle. Um, the, the technology that we fought with from World War I, World War II, the Falklands, Gulf, and right up till today, is completely different, but the the young men and women who take them off cells off to conflict are very similar. So I joined the Royal Air Force in 1981 um, as a uh, the equivalent of a private soldier in the army. I was a uh, I was a technician. I did uh, five years as a technician. Very, had a great time as a young man in the in the military in the 80s, um, and I aspired to greater things. Uh, and I was lucky I had a really good boss uh, who'd been an ex-ranker himself. And he said, John, you need to apply for a commission. And it had always been in the back of my mind. And I went through that, applied for a commission um, in 86, did my officer training and then navigator training. Uh, and I ended up on the front line. And it was the front line then in 1989 at RAF Larbrook in Germany. I just had a a text from my friend Neil, who's watching as we speak. Uh, and we were on the front line together as young officers in our very early 20s. And it was a very different time, Robbie. Um, when I joined, I never really expected to go to war, not on any uh, on the scale that the tornado was expected to go to war. The tornado was part of the NATO nuclear deterrent. Uh, and that's what 90% of our training was. In, uh, in Germany, it was about holding back a Soviet advance if they crossed over the East German, what was then the East German border, uh, and resorting to nuclear uh, weapons fairly early on. So those early days, my first, what, uh, nine years te- in the Air Force were training for an event that I never thought would happen. And in 1990, everything changed. Yeah, it's classic. Isn't it? I mean, when we think back now over... You know, um, th- you know th- almost 30, well, 33 years now from when, in, in August, when um, Kuwait was invaded. But I, but I think all of us were serving at the time. We all we all remember where we were. Indeed, anyone who's, who was following the news, do you remember where you were when you heard it? I was I was actually on a beach in Jamaica. I was on honeymoon uh, right. when I heard about it. And and actually, the the, the time that um, that it, it it all started those those first couple of weeks in August 1990. 
um, if people don't realise that that used to be sort of the block summer leave as well for a lot of people, and uh, uh, and it's the air show season, and it, it, people people's minds were were probably far from going out to to do to do this, and uh, but um, but I think like August 1914, that transition to war was a very confusing period. So um, now you're fully trained, you're in the tornado force. Um, can you give give the audience an idea of what the transition to war really meant to you? How did you have to change training? You know, what do you have to do? What do you have to get ready to do to, 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 to get your mindset ready to go to war? Um, it was uh, eye-opening, uh, to say the least. As I say, you know, we hadn't expected to ever go to war in this way, in a sort of a, a mass uh, a mass conflict. Uh, and it was exciting. There's no doubt about it. Those of us who were relatively young wanted to go. We wanted to be part of it. We didn't want to, to, to miss out. Uh, and I know from reading some of the articles in the West Front Association magazine that that is what a lot of young men was it, were talking about in, the, uh, in 1930, 1940, 1915, the desire to go to be part of it uh with their friends and those app this was absolutely the same for us for the training i mean the, the tornado uh was a a low level ground attack aircraft um we uh, it was designed for the cold war east uh, european uh environment the tornado could fly itself so the 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 presumption was that in the opening hours of any conflict, we would hope for very bad weather, zero visibility, zero, you know, cloud on the ground, hopefully at night. And the tornado could fly itself at 600, well, 600 knots, six, nearly 700 miles an hour, 200 feet above the ground. And the pilot in the front seat, I was the nav in the back seat, the pilot in the front seat would sit with his hands off the controls and the jet would plow through the night, through the cloud. And they would go climb themselves up and down over hills, over power lines, over masts. And so we had trained. We trained for that. What we had to train harder for was things like air-to-air refueling, uh, because uh, the attacks that we, we would be carrying out. And even in the August, all the way through, I would say, till the, the November, December, we still didn't think it would happen. We thought that the politicians would, would get around a table and would stop it. But prepare, you were preparing for the worst and hoping for the best. And it was about uh, ultra low level flying. So uh, at night, the systems would fly themselves. So that would be 200 feet. But during the day, the, the pilots in the front would be manually flying. And towards the end, we were practicing flying at maybe 15, 20, 30 feet above the desert uh, at 600, 700 miles an hour. And that was the standard. Because if we went in in the day, we wanted to be as low as possible to avoid surface-to-air missiles, hostile Iraqi aircraft. So that was the training that took us all the way through to January 1991 and preparing, but never thinking would happen until, for in our case, maybe, maybe six or seven hours before it all started, uh, we were told it's, go it's going to start, you're, uh, you're going. I'm not sure that you haven't frozen there, Rocky. So I will until until I see you moving again. I will simply, yeah, you've definitely frozen, my friend. Um, and so I, you know, so the, tr the I remember uh, the the um, the day, the the morning it all started. You're 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 back there now, Rocky. The morning that it started, um, we'd been on a, a shift system for a for a day, and I remember going in to work because my shift started. Uh, in the early hours, but the, the shift that had been on before us were what were getting ready to go. They were they were putting their pistols into their holsters. The jets were all fully on, and the absolute realization that we were about to go over our own personal top, we were going to take these incredible machines into battle for the first time, was astonishing. It was, in one way, it was exciting, exhilarating. But it was terrifying as well for me yeah. personally. The notion that in within a matter of hours somebody was going to be shooting at us, trying to kill us, whilst we tried to kill them. Absolutely, completely different mindset there, and and that does come out in the book. And what's really good about the book, I think, I I think, is that um, it, it puts across everything in chronological order. 
uh, and it's from the air crew getting ready to go, getting out there, getting embedded in the um, uh, within the coalition, within the big air plan. That's a massive air plan that was going to be run, uh, you know, even even on night day, you know, day one of the the war. Um, but um, uh, but what what's what's it it's interlaced with is the chronological order of events of the politics going on behind the scenes and and what's really good and this is what uh, uh, I think a lot of good stuff on the first award ha um, uh, it covers is that it, it, you bounce between theatre and the home front because yeah. what's going on with the families is from a military person's personal perspective it's just as important about anything that's going on in theatre as well so so that that's really really great but but again um moving into that now we're into january you now get you know getting ready for the for, for day one um how was the tornado force then integrated within the whole of the coalition how did you avoid crashing into everybody else because there's going to be 700 missions the first night uh, well <laughs> i mean in in real terms the old uh, way that we used to fly in europe uh in germany where you would have sometimes you know <laughs> two three four hundred nato aircraft flashing around the sky at once and certainly uh, in parts of the UK, like the Lake District, um, uh, Northumberland, uh, see and avoid. And that really was, you know, you would look around you and make sure you didn't hit anything. Now, it's, it's a little bit more complex than that because the air tasking order, I think on the first day, I think, uh, thinking off the top of my head, there was something in the order of uh, two and a half thousand sorties in the first 12 hours or something. And everybody was going into different parts of Iraq. But the reality was that you knew that, you know, so we knew that we were part of a, a, a large attack in, an, in a specific area in southeastern Iraq. But we never saw the American fighters that were up above us. We never saw the AWACS aircraft that were controlling us. We never saw the anti-missile uh, aircraft that were firing missiles at some of the uh, Iraqi radar sites. The only aircraft we saw were our formation of tornadoes and our tankers as we approached them at whatever it was, uh, 15, 16,000 feet. And once we dropped over the border, we never saw another aircraft. Uh, you know, we could see what was going on on the ground as we flashed over. But most of the time, you simply looked out of your aircraft in the old fashioned way and made sure there was nobody in your bit of sky. That's amazing, yeah. The and and we're now on, if you like, we're now you've taken us up to the seventeenth of January, nineteen ninety one. So that's the, the day one. You know, the first aircraft are going over the border, uh, and you're in the second wave. So the first wave, I think, goes goes at night, doesn't it? In, in, in o, o two hundred in the morning, um, and, um, and and your mission though is during the day, and and actually a daylight raid over a flat desert is it's not the it's not the best place to put a fast jet, is it? <laughs> I mean, the, the short answer is we were the first daylight lower level raid and the last one, in actual fact. Nobody tried. I mean, it, I think it's important to see because there's a lot of um, incorrect um, suppositions about what happened in the Gulf War. And you guys from the West Front Association know the same about the, the classic tra um, uh, rumours or tropes that come out of the, the First World War. So. There was a lot of rumour that said the tornado wasn't good enough for the job or that it shouldn't have been flying at low level or it shouldn't have been doing this or it shouldn't have been doing that. On the first 24 hours, almost every one of the strikers was at low, the, the, the attack aircraft was at low level. So things like the B-52s, the giant B-52 bombers, what have they got? I can't, is it a 180 foot wingspan? I, I think off the top of my head, they were flying at 50 feet over the desert. We were flying at 30, 40, 50 feet over the desert. The, the jets that went in at night were all flying in at 200 feet. Everybody was at low level because we all believed that was the safest place to go. And we adapted as we went through. And I mean, for the, the, the first people to go in, uh, so that the first, uh, there was eight tornadoes from each detachment. So there's 24 tornadoes went in. And the tornado, as I say, is flying itself. So you're flying in what was called parallel track. So you've got two tornadoes at the front, two behind, two behind, two behind. And they're going in what is a, basically a massive steam train of power. And the jets are flying themselves. And at, the, at night, and this was incredible. And I remember, you know, speaking to one of the guys I interviewed for the book who led the very first tornado mission said they, were, they, hit, they went over the border at 200 feet, 650, 700 miles an hour, screaming over the border. And you can't see the jet next to you because all your lights are out. 
So you've got a jet maybe two miles to your right, you can't see it. You've got a jet two miles behind. And if you're at the back, so you've got eight jets in front of you, you don't, you can't see them. Everybody is flying in their own black bit of sky at night. And the guy who was leading it said he was in total blackness. He said, you can't, you can see the glow of the, the lights in the cockpit. There's no night vision goggles at this time. Nobody's looking out with night vision goggles. It is pitch black. Then he said, he looked over in his, uh, uh, to his uh, left hand side in his uh, left 10 o'clock. And he said, he said, I could see a little pinprick of light in the desert. And he said, uh, and he said to the, the, my boss who was in the back seat, said, uh, I wonder what that is. And he said, as we got closer, this pinprick of light evolved as we got closer. And it was out there on my left. He said, I could see it was flashing lights. And it was AAA, it was anti aircraft artillery streaming up from the ground and he said as we got closer and closer out on the left you could see he said it was like a sparkling dome a kaleidoscope of explosive flashing anti-aircraft artillery and he said to the boss in the back he said bloody hell boss somebody's gonna get absolutely hammered over that way uh and the boss looked at his map and said yeah that's where we're going mate and as, as he said it, because the jets are flying themselves on autopilot, all the jets turned and pointed at this glowing light. And it was just, he said, it's like flying into a, an exploding kaleidoscope of shells. Now, at 700 miles an hour, you're in and out in maybe 10, 15, 20 seconds. But he said it was like trying to run through the shower without getting wet. Yeah. Uh, and it was the, and nobody had ever experienced this before. And this is the most important thing about these this early days. No, none of us had been shot at before. Nobody in the tornado force had ever been to war in the tornado before. We had a couple of Falklands veterans, but they had not seen anything like this. Nobody had seen anything like this. And yeah. so, but and when they came back and told us all of this, we thought, oh my God, we're going in daytime when they can see us. And so that was concentrating our minds. The good thing about going in daytime is you can't see the AAA. Because it's the, you yeah. can't see the glowing fire. You can't see the shells exploding. You see the odd puff of smoke. And, you know, the veterans that I spoke to through the Lancasters in the Second World War, they said that you, in daytime you could see the puffs of black smoke as the shells went off. And we could see a bit of that. But we were a bit oblivious to most of this as we headed in towards the target. Wow. Okay, so uh, so you're on the second wave. Um, can you talk us through what your target was and 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 sort of the uh, and there's a great there's, there's a great chapter in the book and uh, you know that 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 really brings it to life. And the picture behind me is on the uh, the cover of the book and you keep turning the book over to look and uh, at the um, uh, at the picture because it sort of ties in with with a lot of the raids that are going on. But you're in the daytime. Uh, but he talks through what your target is and um, um, and uh, the, the the chain of events that leads up to uh, you actually being shot down. So we're we're attacking Al Romalia South uh, East Airfield, I think it was called, um, and it's basically we were told intelligence told us anybody who believes in te military intelligence are a contradiction in terms. So intelligence told us that this was an undefended airfield, and we were going to what's called interdict it. We were gonna go and uh, lob, uh, each jet was armed with eight 1,000 pound bombs, and we were gonna lob, so it fly in low, pull up, and lob these bombs into the middle of the airfield to uh, basically disrupt any operations that were on time to delay fuses, some would explode and go off, and it was basically to stop the Iraqis being able to use this airfield. Uh, and obviously, we're kind of heading in there at, um, I guess I'm trying to remember now, maybe half past eight in the morning. So it's a beautiful, blue, sunny morning over the desert. Uh, and we cross over the border. We cross over the border quite a way to the, uh, the west before crossing over the border and then turning east to head in to the, air, to the airfield, trying to avoid some of the... Uh, some of the uh, builds up of troops uh, and other airfields. And I remember as we kind of headed in, you know, we started, I, you could start to see the troops on the road. Sorry, my dog is, what are you doing there? <laughs> I don't know why you're here. Oh, come here. 
Um, sorry, it's disturbing the women off. Um, yeah, I could start to see military vehicles on the ground, thousands and thousands and thousands of military vehicles, troop concentrations, and we are flying over the top of them. And you could almost, you couldn't see them looking upwards, where you could sense that these jets screaming over their heads at 30 feet meant that they were, that, you know, they knew we were coming. There's no doubt about that. And it was quite a, quite a surreal experience to know that this was your enemy and given the chance, they would kill them. They would kill us. There's no, you know, they would. That's, that's the reality of war. They were, you know, most of them were, in retrospect, were, were reasonable, honest, decent human beings and they were defending their land from attack as we would defend our land. But th this was the reality of war. <laughs> and so we, we fly, <coughs> excuse me, uh, we're flying in uh, and we're meant to be lobbing these bombs. And there's a, 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 and basically our attack goes wrong. My fault in the back seat, not pressing all the right sequence of buttons. <laughs> but the, the reality was that myself and John Peters, our attack uh, went wrong. And that was a devastating feeling, uh, Rocky. I mean, it really was. This was the first day of the war, the first combat mission I'd ever flown in my life. The one there where you wanted to prove yourself, you wanted to say, I've done it, I've been part of it. I I did it. And I, you know, that it cocked, I cocked it up and it went wrong. And we were talking, we have, we're, and the flak's coming up at us and we're kind of trying, we're exiting the area. We didn't, you know, we didn't re-attack or anything like that. We're just running out of the area. But JP and I are say, talking about, you know, oh my, this got, what will people say about us? What will people say that we messed this up? And we were worried, more worried about our reputations than we were for our lives. And then our none of that mattered because the next part of my journey kicked in. Yeah, and you were hit by a substrate missile, was it? The, um, but but again, in, in, in daytime, I, I, I guess it was an off the shoulder, an on the shoulder job or a lightweight one. Um, and uh, and obviously in daylight as well. You, it's it's not just the fact that the the weapon's going to sense you there and and come off the uh, come off the shoulder for there. But but there's the, the visual acquisition by by all these people on the ground. As you quite really said that for the first time you're in combat, there are people now trying to kill you. And I guess the the and I know exactly where you are with the you know not not making the switches right. We've all done it. We've all been in flights. We've done it. We that's we 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 train and train and train. But it's 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 the that, that sometimes it, it just doesn't work. But but in terms of the um uh the, the, the that section of the book as you you talk about it, it's it's almost seems like you yourself and um, John Peters were it's a bit of a surreal moment there where time just stands still. That um that everything happens probably in microseconds, but oh. it's it it just you don't appreciate the time because you've no, now been. I mean, we, it, it, I mean it really did happen in a in a in an instant. So we were now maybe. I don't know. Uh, we were probably a minute off target, something like that. We ditched the weapons to make us uh, lighter. We were heading for home. You know, we were. We thought we were safe, and then we're passing these built-up areas, and obviously, all these troops have got handheld surface-to-air missiles. And these days, there are systems within aircraft that can detect the launch of a heat-seeking missile. We didn't have that. If it, you know, and it came from behind over there, and I didn't. You know, we just didn't see it coming. So JP, my pilot's flying. And I reckon we, the, we, the, I, the, the accident data recorder, the black box, said I think we were at something like 28 feet or something like that. So he's, we're flying along at 28 feet and 650 miles an hour. And suddenly there were, there's a massive explosion at, in the back of the aircraft. And it's like being hit by a supersonic telegraph pole. And so we're flying along, looking up at blue sky. And we're talking about what we're going to do and how we'll get it right next time. Suddenly, there's an explosion and the aircraft, instead of flying along, is kind of it's flying almost sideways and it's almost tumbling. It's kind of upside down. So instead of going like that, we're now kind of doing that. And where I've been looking up at bright blue sky, I was now looking up at brown sand. At least I presume it was the sand that was brown at that particular moment. But this is happening in, in you know, in, in, a, in a, a, a nanosecond. Um, we very nearly hit the ground then, and we obviously, you know, we would have just been killed and nobody would have been any the wiser. Um, but JP, because we've trained for this, we, you know, every, you know that, every in the military, you practice, you practice, you practice, so that it becomes, so there is a drill for if the aircraft's out of control to try to get it 
back into control again. And he did it. And we managed to kind of get up ourselves upright. But all of the electronics of the aircraft are down, all the flyby wire, uh, all the sirens and the alarms and the warnings are going off. Uh, the engine is on fire. Uh, and we're in a parlous state. We try to uh, to put the fire out. We try to get some to, to get um, to get ourselves back in the ship. We turn immediately south, which was against the the tasking rules because you could be shot down if you didn't exit in the right manner. But we were putting out emergency calls. We were heading straight for the border uh, in the hope that we could cross the border. But um, I said uh, at one. The, the fire warnings are going off and we couldn't put them out. And normally we'd eject straight away, but we didn't want to eject where we were. We'd just been hit by a missile from somebody who could see us. And so we're in danger of exploding as well. And so we're kind of trying to edge our way further towards the border. Uh, and I can't, we, you've got rear view mirrors in a tornado, same as you've got in a car. And you've got, you've got a couple of rear view mirrors that sit up there like that. And I looked in my rear view mirror and the back of a tornado, you, well, you, 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 you're providing the perfect picture, Rocky, in actual fact. You know, so, so if, you, if I looked in my rear view mirror, so where you are, you can normally see the wings and you can normally see the tail and everything else. And everything had gone. The aircraft wasn't there anymore. It was a ball of flame. And the flame was marching steadily to where I sit in the rear seat. And I said to JP, it was actually, and it sounds almost foolish, it was actually quite calm. I said, we're on fire, mate. And almost as calm as that, he said, yeah, no, we're on fire. I could see the warnings. I said, no, 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 we're on fire. Look in the, and he looked and he went, oh, F. Mm -hmm. uh, and that then, you, you know, we could have exploded, you know, in, within half a second. And so when you're at that position, you then say, right, we are now, we're going to have to eject. We can't go any further. And so I put out a radio call to, uh, to say we're, we're on fire, we're ejecting. Nobody heard the call in actual fact. Uh, JP pulled up and we got, I think we climbed to about, I think it was about 160 feet or something like that, maybe 200 feet. Uh, and then we, you know, I said, stand by, stand by. And we just, uh, three, two, one, eject, eject, eject. Yeah. Um, and for people in the audience who... Um, might not know about ejection seats or whatever, but it's it to, to excuse the pun. The flash to bang is one and a half seconds from you putting the handle to ending up on a on a parachute. I mean, look, it's I mean, it's uh, it's everything is automatic in modern ejection seats, and you know we may we may get round to talk about this a little bit later on, but that's the subject of my next book, which is out in uh, in a few months' time. Um, so, so you pull the handle and technology takes over. And technology, so we had Mark 10 Martin Baker ejection seats, which then were the best ones that uh, were available. So you pull a handle and technology takes over. And it takes over in less than a thousandth of a second. But that feels like a lifetime once you've pulled the handle and you're waiting for something to happen. Um, and so I pulled the handle, and then, but then suddenly everything happens at once. So you're... Um, the, the Perspex cockpit above your head, it's got an explosive charge in it, which will explode and clear the Perspex canopy away. But first, what it does is it, it's got rockets under the canopy and it moves those rockets up so that the canopy lifts up and, and sits out in the airflow and it's thrown off. But if it doesn't do that, the, the bomb above your head goes off. And then the, the, there's some uh, explosive charges in the back of the seat, which force which go off with a force of something like 20 times the force of gravity. Um, and you start to rise up. And then as you rise up, you, you, this is happening in, in a fraction of a second. The rocket motors under your seat fire. So the, 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 basically, as you, you go, you, you're rising up, your arms are dragged in on the straps, your legs are dragged in on the straps, your shoulder arms are holding you in the back of the seat. So, and you're rising up at uh, about 20 times the force of gravity, and you, that you're out into the airflow, you're this tumbling that you're just aware of, or I was just aware of, then suddenly the rest of the seat starts to do its business and it cuts you free, and then the parachute opens automatically. And so what I have tried to explain to you there 
happens in just two seconds. So from pulling the handle <clears throat> to being under the parachute is two and a half seconds. And it is, you, you, you know almost nothing about it uh, mm. at, at all. Uh, and and now you now there you are in parachutes, yeah. Not very far from the place where the rest of the group has bombed, or the the rest of the wave has bombed. Um, you know, minutes beforehand. So, um, but one of the one of the things that leaps out in, in in the book that I thought was great though is that when when you eventually end up on the ground, one of the first things that yourself and John Peters end up doing is end up in hysterical laughter, which is it's. But again, it's that's that's the moment, isn't it? It was such a totally surreal situation. We, we, my squadron, unfortunately, in Bahrain was billeted at the five-star Sheraton Hotel because there was no military accommodation. So typical Air Force, you know, the officers bagged the best hotel. Uh, so about, what, six hours before, I'd been in the Sheraton Hotel. Yeah. And, you, you know, there's, it's, uh, uh, but we'd buy a swimming pool and we'd been, you know, we knew what was happening, but we were still living in a hotel. Now we were standing in the desert behind enemy lines. And it was so surreal. So it was just so surreal. I remember uh, I picked myself up and ran over to where JP was. Uh, and I said, we're in Iraq. I said, can, we're actually in Iraq. Can you believe it? And we all were laughing. Uh, and but, I mean, for a, for a couple of seconds. And then again, your training kicks in. And so you're trying to manage your survival equipment. You're trying to uh, go through some of the rescue procedures in the hope that somebody can come and rescue. We knew it was never going to happen, but you know you can't give up. You know we're still we're still there. We're alive. We're we're injured a bit, but we're, we're we're still mobile. And so we're going we're going through this training process, this process again that we've practiced and practiced, never ever thinking that we do it for real. And we were in the desert whatever it was, 150, 200 miles behind enemy lines. And it was the most astonishing experience. And we kind of, we picked ourselves up and we uh, headed off trying to get to uh, a point where we thought we might get rescued or there was a possibility of getting this. Yeah, that's, that's amazing. And, and, and again, in ECRA, in the military, we get, we've got various levels of escape and evasion training and everything else. It's, it's never going to simulate the real the real thing, but um, but I think one of the things I always remember from um, escape and evasion training was that if you are going to be captured, though, one of the most important phases is that initial contact, the first contact with with the enemy, and it could be the 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 the, the, the band of people who want to to, to shoot you straight away because you just bomb you know bomb their friends over in the airfield and stuff. But but in it, 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 it you you do cover an element. There's a there's a level-headed Iraqi officer who um, comes not to your, well, to your assistance, but um, calms the situation of the, the the crowd of people, of dozen people who uh, finally come across in a in a truck, and and and, uh, uh, and um, I think you get your heads down into a um, in, into like a little gully or whatever. But um, uh, but he's the one that sort of not saves your bacon, but he calms the situation such that you get the and, and even in the First World War, I think that any war. That's the most dangerous point of being taken prisoner is actually the first I'm being taken prisoner. And, uh, and you're not going to be killed straight away. You're going to be taken off. And somebody recognizes the, the value of you as a prisoner. No, no doubt about it. I mean, it, we're getting, we were on the run for about, I'm thinking maybe two hours ish, something like that. I'm trying to remember. And we're kind of running through, uh, running through the desert. We could, it, after we could hear people following us uh, and we're leaving tra you know, tracks wherever we go. And kind of after a couple of hours, we kind of this bullet, this <laughs> shots ring out, and again, you've gone from so you've gone from the Sheraton Hotel, an officer in the Royal Air Force, uh, flying a twenty, what was then twenty twenty five million pound high tech fighter, shot out the sky on the ground, and now people are shooting at you with real bullets, and it was a, a, an utterly horrifying terrifying experience i was taken back you know so M M jp and i dropped down in this kind of shallow bit and they're kind of raking the ground with these eight there's uh, whatever it was a dozen kind of soldiers that uh ak-47s and they're just raking the ground and so we're hiding kind of and uh in this kind of a little uh depression and there's a little cactus plants we're trying to hide behind a little cactus plant you know i'm 
well, I put a bit of beef on since then, but I was still a big fella back then. Um, you know, so we're hiding behind this cactus plant and there's thrown duff tufts of sand being thrown up and the bullets are whizzing past your ears. And I was, and do you remember when you were kids on a Sunday afternoon watching cowboy films? Uh, yeah. And they kind of, boo, 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 that, that kind of bullets and people kind of dodging them and running forward and never being, it was, it felt like that. It felt like being in a cowboy movie. Um, and I said, I, I, I said to JP, because we talked about the reality of being captured. And one of the, one, you know, obviously people, just some of your audience will remember that, you know, Saddam Hussein said we'd be torn limb from limb. And we actually believed that. We thought we'd be shot, killed, murdered, um, torn apart, uh, out of hand. And we had this idea, I had, we had, no, we had a, an idea that rather than um, be captured, we'd commit suicide. Uh, it's now called suicide by cop in America. And I, and, you know, this was a very real, this was because of the circumstances and the depth of the fear and what we were facing. As these guys start coming over the top towards us and we, we put our hands up at one point and they kept shooting. So we kind of dropped down again. And then as we dropped down, they, they stopped shooting and say, get up, get up, get up. And so we got up and they start shooting again. And I said to JP, we're going to get shot. We're going to get killed here. Let's go out with a bang. So my plan was we'd stand up, charge towards them with our pathetic little Walther PP pistols, kind of James Bond, but with little, James Bond little things, hopeless, rubbish things. Uh, we'd try and kill a couple of them, and then we'd be shot, and it'd be all over. Uh, and that was my plan. And JP said to me, uh, he said, no, let's not. There's always hope. And, you know, 30, whatever it is now, 33, 32 years on, I still kind of think about that. because. There was a very real chance that I would have just got myself killed. Uh, and so we got up, they started shooting again, uh, but then they stopped and then they, they just pounced on us. And there was about 12 uh, soldiers uh, in or, uh, and Air Force people and they just started kicking seven bells out of us. Um, they're firing their weapons in the air. And I thought, well, listen, that's fine. It's going to be over. Uh, and luckily, there's an officer, an Air Force officer there who got hold of them. Uh, and, they, you know, they give us a bit of a kick, up, quite a bit of a kicking. Uh, but uh, they were kind of, we were captured, stuck in the vehicles, uh, and we were heading back off uh, quite quickly out of the area uh, and towards a, a big military base. And that was then, so that was the next stage of my journey. So we'd gone from Air Force officer, tornado navigator, ejectee, evader, captured and now as a prisoner and I was about to be under interrogation. Yeah, and I, I, what, what's, what's amazing then is you go into that whole process of being taken through from airfield to airfield, presumably further up the chain for interrogation and, and everything else. And, but at this point as well, just that it's that you think about your, um, your, 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 your mates now, they still don't know what's happened to you. So I think there's a long period I think um, I'm, I'm, I'm right in saying it's when your pictures appear on yeah. news that actually, which is not for some time, but no. it's a lot of time no. playing on you where you were uh, and whatever. And and I think um, the 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 what interrogations and some of that stuff that you went through in the whole process and and the violence of uh, of being a cap uh, you know, against you as a captor. I think that's something we might might want to bring out when we go into the question and answer session in a moment. But but I think that's where the world really attention turned to you and you and you and John Peters were the, the focus of mm. everything that was going on in the world at that, at, at, you know, for that, for that moment then where, um, which I think um, in, in your book, you said it was uh, broadcast or die was the, what you talked about, you know, do I, do I go on the TV? Because I know we, you know, you're not meant to go on t television because it's aiding enemy propaganda and everything else. But, but the broadcast or die part of the, the book was, um, uh, I think uh, comes across really well, but, but but actually, it, it, in a, in in a very invariably what it did, it it let people know you were alive and you were a prisoner of war, and that the Iraqis should have had some responsibility for looking after you as a prisoner of war. So, but yeah. uh, but I, I think I think going into the um, into the uh, question and answer session, I think probably the interrogations 
uh, side of things would be will be something I think will be really good to talk about. But but we're we're sort of running out of time because all of a sudden it's like all of these. It's we we could talk all night about this. But um, so when we get to um, when you're in captivity, one of the one of the questions I really did have was. Um, was there any indication of what else was going on? Were you completely in the dark of uh, what was happening with the rest of the war? And um, did, you, did you know grand operations had started? And uh, leading up to the point when you know, obviously the, the, the next step was was it was going to be all over and, and you're repatriated. But uh, did you have any awareness of anything that, with the Iraq? I mean, we, were, we were kept in uh, isolation in a number of different prisons. Um, for well, for most of the time, so we had no concept at all. Uh, you could hear air attacks going on, you could hear shooting, but you know you had you had no information. You didn't see you know. For, I think probably we were held in uh, the Mukhabarat, the secret police headquarters, for I think four weeks, uh, and we never saw. I never saw another person. Uh, you could hear screaming and shouting and yelling going on, but you never saw anybody. It was a little hatch on a three inch steel metal door that opened and somebody might give you some food once every two or three days. So you never had any concept. And it's one of the things that, you know, I mean, obviously we're talking about me in this kind of, uh, in this webinar, but in actual fact, the book is about everybody else. I'm only a tiny little part of the, the book. The book is about everybody else. And so you talked about my friends and they didn't know what had happened to us and their bravery of you know, going back and forwards, knowing that people were being shot down again and again and again and again, not just the Brits and the tornadoes, but there were Americans, uh, uh, Kuwaiti, Italian, there were a number of different uh, jets being shot down. And what I've tried to, to do is tell their story, and as you alluded to at the beginning, because it's about information, it's about letters, it's about who knows what, tell the stories of the families back home because they didn't know either. So the families didn't know what was going on. And so, you know, I'm using their experiences, you know, the the 13 year old girl who's uh, woken up in her boarding house at school to be told her dad's missing and then nobody knows if he's alive or dead. Well, you know, that kind of uh, reality of warfare is really important. Uh, yeah. And so, you know, that the people didn't know, there were, I think in the order of maybe 30 or 40 POWs by the end of the conflict. And there's only maybe seven or eight of us that had been paraded on TV. And it was a double-edged sword. For me, it was a, a source of eternal shame. I did not want to do that TV broadcast. It was done literally at the point of an AK-47. You can't see it in those famous pictures, but there's an AK-47 pointed at me and it was done under threat of death. I didn't want to do it, but it was one of those things that there was, you know, I couldn't do anything else about it. I could either be shot or do it, broadcast, broadcast or die. And everybody felt that way. And there was a real sense of shame at, uh, at letting the side down uh, and, you know, kind of failure of the attack, being shot down, failure to evade, failure to get home, being captured, giving in to the brutality of the interrogation, being paraded on TV. It was this roller coaster of emotions for for whatever it was, seven weeks. Uh, but, and we never knew if we were going to be alive or dead. We were nearly killed on two or three occasions, being bombed by our own side. We went through mock executions where we thought we were going to die. Uh, so you never knew if you were going to be alive, to, to be alive or if this was going to be a, a seven-week war or a seven-month war or a seven-year war. And, you know, in the end, it was mercifully short still costly for the Brits or for the Allies and for more so for the Iraqis and the people. But eventually we were released. Yeah, and that takes us up now with a few minutes to go. Um, the, the, the repatriation side, can you just talk us through that? Because that's that must have been a really difficult time for you and and something actually the, the, the British military probably weren't used to doing really, to be honest. And uh, so how, how did you find out that it was all over and what, what, what were the steps taken? Well, I mean, basically, the reality was that on the 28th of February, after Saddam's forces capitulated and left and ran from Kuwait in those images that many people will remember, the highway of death leading north uh, towards Basra and, um, in Iraq, out of Kuwait, uh, the shooting stopped, which we, they'd been shooting and bombing and anti-aircraft guns every single month, uh, and it stopped. And... Uh, and you, you had 
thinking, is this real? Has it, has it finished? You know, we expected this to go on for months. Uh, and sure enough, about three days later, I think, four days later, an Iraqi god came into the cell and said, the war's over, you can go home. And that was the end of it. And we were handed over to the Red Cross in, uh, in Iraq. We had, were stuck in Iraq for 24 hours because of the weather, um, put onto a Red Cross aircraft, uh, and flown out of Baghdad, which was terrifying in itself, uh, landed in Saudi Arabia, uh, and that was it. You know, we were it was over for, for that aspect. We were um, the military wasn't it had never done anything like this in modern times. In actual fact, uh, you know, there were quite there was an aircraft full of prisoners of war, uh, and it wasn't it was quite difficult in parts. And they didn't know who was alive or dead. We'd lost uh, six tornadoes, I think, uh, and they didn't know who was alive or dead. And so there were. Uh, we had each every single person who was listed as missing in action had somebody waiting for them. And so JP and I had been paraded on TV. So they knew we were alive at the time, but there'd been reports that we'd been killed. My parents had been had seen a newspaper report that said I'd been tortured to death in February. And that's, you know, that, so they didn't know if I was alive or dead until we walked off the aircraft. Uh, and obviously there were a number of people waiting uh, who didn't uh, who didn't walk off the aircraft. And the, the, the people who are waiting to look after them simply had to go back to the back to their um, various different bases in the Middle East. Uh, and we were then taken to Cyprus to the military hospital, went through a kind of medicals and a lot of psychological stuff, which we railed against at the time, but was completely the right thing to do. You know, we talk about shell shock in World War One. Well, all, you know, all of us suffered in some way, shape or form with post-traumatic stress disorder because of what we'd been through for seven weeks. Nothing like what some of the people in World War One went through. Uh, and then it was kind of, we were flown back, in my case, flown back to Germany, reunited with friends uh, and family and a few celebratory beers in the bar at RAF Long. That's fantastic. And John, this is absolutely brilliant. We are... I think right out of time because I know there's lots of people in the audience. I think who and David will be lining up. Uh, I'm sure lo lots of questions from people in the audience who who want to ask you some things. And we really have just scratched the surface. Um, this has been a brilliant session. I think um, um, it, I'll, I'll put a plug the book, but it's um, oh, it's not going to show me there. Yeah, Tornado um, yeah, in the Eye of Storm. Uh, a really good read. The politics, the frontline activity, what's going on in the background is all great. And um, and I. Just thank you for everyone for uh, tuning in. And uh, David, I know you've got some questions there, but before we do that, um, John, is there anything, any other books that uh, that you, you've got out and people might find interesting? Always, always. always. <laughs> <laughs> Who would have thought when I was in the darkest cell in Baghdad that what is 32 years later, and I think I've written 17 books now. So on the in the veteran side of things, uh, Spitfire is about uh, the Spitfire at war and then Lancaster, and I spoke to the veterans, I, it's their stories. Um, and obviously Tornado was the book that followed on. And David, I know that you're gonna be giving us some questions and as the, as the most tiny, insignificant, dare I say, valueless prize uh, for, the, for, the, for the audience tonight, I'll, I've got a signed copy that I will present to the person who asks the best question uh, in our little Q&A session now. Uh, and then somewhere, I've, got, I've lost, I've, forgotten that I've lost the cover of the new book. As we alluded to um, uh, during the chat there, my new book is about the history of the ejection seat and the people who used it. And I said earlier on that one of my mates was watching, Neil uh, was watching with a mate. And Neil, in actual fact, features in that book because he had one of the most horrific ejections the world uh, in, in the history of the kind of the Mark 10 ejection seat. Utterly, utterly awful, terribly injured. Uh, you know, went back to flying afterwards, but it's how the ejection seat evolved from the 1940s through to what it is now. Uh, and so that is out in May in actual fact. Let, but let's let's do some questions, Dave. Brilliant. Uh, thanks, thanks, thanks ever so much, Rocky, for, for, for hosting that those uh, that chat with, with John. And thank you ever so much, John, for, for that. In the time on the tradition of these uh, WFA mm -hmm. webinars, if you've enjoyed that, please show your, your, your appreciation in the usual way by pressing the raise hand button on the Zoom software. And John, I can confirm that there's hundreds of hundreds of hands going up. Yeah. 
as a virtual... I've just, I've just done it myself to say I enjoyed it with Rob. <laughs> as a virtual <laughs> round of applause, so that, that's brilliant. Right, OK, question time. So, Sandra, do you want to fire in your question? Yes, I'd absolutely love to. Um, I was going to ask you, John, how you navigate on a tornado, given um, the film... I've read your book, Lancaster and Spitfire. Tornado looks fantastic. I must get it. Uh, navigating on a tornado is obviously very different on a Lancaster you sit there at your table from what I've seen um, and and you navigate all the way how do you do it on a tornado do you actually start before you leave you sit there and work it out on a map and then you put it into a system or have you got some wonderful system you just sit there and press a lot of buttons and it does the impossible for you Excellent question, Sandra. Um, I mean, so when we did our training uh, on uh, at Navigator School, we used uh, very old fashioned techniques, not dissimilar to the ones that the Lancaster guys used on a map, on a chart, plotting it. Slightly different on a tornado was, but it's a tornado is a very basic computer system, but you did have an electronic map table in the, in the, um, in the planning room where you would plan your sortie and you would load it on. Do you remember old fashioned C90 cassette tapes? Yes. You would load it onto them and then you would put it into the aircraft's computer system. So the aircraft's computer system had a navigation system uh, that, that had a moving map so you could see where you were. But you still, I always still carried a map and a target map. And so it wasn't like Lancaster's, but it was still planned in a very old fashioned way, but the tornado computer system certainly uh, helps you to do that. There's no doubt about it. Excellent oh, question. Brilliant, thank you, John. And it's lovely to see your dog, Ralph, there. I saw he <laughs> fell in the, in the water recently. I hope he's recovered. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thanks, thanks very much for that, Sandra. Um, Mark Smith, Mark, do you wanna unmute yourself and start your video? Uh, th thank you very much anyway for that, your presentation. I got um, interested. What trade were you? That you mentioned you were an, an ex ranker to start with, right? Yeah. So uh, Mark, as so I was a L Tech TC, a telecommunications technician, I did my training at RAF Locking uh, before I uh, went out. I was on tactical communications for five years before I got commissioned. Well, that's interesting. You weren't into aviation as as such, you know, as in aircraft. And uh, my 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 question really is. Um, the JP233 weapon, do you believe that was a waste of money with the results of what actually happened to the tornado trying to deliver it? So it's, a, it's quite a specific question about the weapon that we use. It was designed to attack Cold War Russian airfields. And people did talk about that. It didn't work in the Gulf. It's, it's one of those kind of um, misnomers that, uh, that got through. If you look at so what it was designed to do was destroy the airfields and disrupt the enemy from using their airfields. And in the first three days, it did that. And so, no, it wasn't a waste of money. It was specifically for the European theatre, but as a weapon, it did exactly what it was uh, uh, was meant to do on the tin, to be perfectly honest. So people really suffered, though, didn't they? Some of the aircrew really suffered no. trying to deliver this. No, no, no. Again, no. this is... This is you know, I'm not going to go into that now because it's very specific and you need to you need to read the book. But there are things that people said happened that didn't happen. So you need to read the book to find out what the reality of using the tornado, using at, low the level. tornado at low level was. OK. And my final part is, however, did you thank Martin Baker and the armourers for saving your life? Well, so, uh, so in time on a tradition... Uh, I went to visit Martin Baker and, uh, and had a little visit with him and thanked them all for the ejection seat. And you'll mark and you'll understand this. I took a crate of beer to our seat bay to thank them as well. So we'll uh, we'll move on to the next question. Thanks for that. Thank, thanks, Matt. Um, <laughs> Bill Twist. Uh, John, great presentation. Question one. Uh, how were you and John Peters selected as a crew? And I'm putting that in, in mind against the Second World War Bomber Command crew composition. And question um, number two, when you were put on TV, admittedly at gunpoint, how much of the previous training, at was it Bud Colgrip or whatever, uh, as far as counter-interrogation, were you conscious of? Because your pictures were so tremendously powerful in the British media when they were published. Uh, thanks for that, Bill. Um, 
I think that um, how were we selected as a crew? We were basically, you were kind of put together with your level of experience and ability, mostly within the squadron. Uh, and the bot, you know, it was just one of those things that people, uh, it was almost a, a dynamic thing that happened where people who were moved, simply came together uh, and they became crews. And we trained that way uh, for the whole of the war. Normally, you would never fly with the same person day in, day out on the squadron. Uh, it was very different in World War II and the Lancaster, of course, because it was very much a select your own crew, go and find yourself a pilot, go and find yourself a navigator, go and find yourself uh, an engineer. So it was different then. But basically, the squadron executives got together and said, right, these people will make a crew and they've got this level of experience. These people will make a crew. They're the best ones we've got. They'll be leading the sorties. So it came about like that. Um, how, what about the interrogation training? Uh, uh, we didn't have any interrogation training, Bill. You know, the, this the, again, a classic misnomer. We didn't, we, I had not done any, there was no such thing as a conduct after capture course then. That came after our experiences. Uh, we'd had a basic kind of almost a, something in the Cold War that said, you know, kind of, st you still use your big four, your number, rank, name, your date of birth. Uh, and it was, so there was no interrogation training at all. It was all a massive shock. And it changed in the aftermath very, very quickly because they realized that it's been something that had been ignored uh, for some time in actual fact. So thanks for that, Bill. Thank that, you. Thanks, thanks Bill. Um, right, okay. Tre Trevor Pove has asked me to ask this particular question on, on his behalf. So Trevor asks, what do you think caused you to press the wrong buttons? Um, I think that it's one of those things that if you've done the same thing, over and over and over again, 10 for 10 years, sometimes, and this is a, 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 it's a known phenomenon, in, uh, in, uh, especially in, in aviation, civilian and military, you think that you've done something when you haven't. Now, you know, I say that I pressed the wrong buttons. I think that's, again, it's quite technical and nobody knows what happened, but in my feeling is that, uh, it, that's, that's how things panned out. But the simple fact is the bombs didn't come off when they were shut off, and that was my that was my role in that jet. So it was my fault. Uh, we make mistakes. You know, you, if, if you press the wrong button on your computer today, you might lose a file. Uh, when we did it, you could die. So, you know, that's just one of those things that we went through. But thanks for that question, David. Thanks. Norman Clark. Norman, do you want to unmute yourself there? Okay. Thank you, John. Um, I'm interested. I, I mean, we've all seen sort of Second World War films with the Gestapo officer beating folk for no particular reason and you think well what are they going you know what are they going to question you about and I wonder if you felt that there was a purpose or some controlling thing behind the question you're being asked or was this just simply an excuse to hit you again? I mean it's a very good question Norman and it's a bit of both actually so they, they, this is how they operated this is how the Iraqi military operate. This is how they treated Iranian prisoners, and this is how the Iranians treated Iraqi no. prisoners. This is what they did. Um, and so, on one hand, they uh, they simply resorted to violence because that was their default mode of operating. And so, in many ways, they didn't know what they wanted to ask us. If that makes sense, so they were. We did. We the 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 point was. In, at that time, that you simply didn't say anything. Number, rank, name, date of birth, and the simple phrase, I cannot answer that question. But you knew that you'd give in. So when they're beating you with a kind of a rubber hose or stubbing cigarettes out on your ear, you know that you're going to give in, but you're trying to hold out as long as possible for personal pride, no doubt about it, and also just in case they know the question to ask. So for instance, they could have asked, how about rescue procedures? And they could have called in a rescue attempt using us and shot down a rescue helicopter. They didn't do any of that. So they didn't know what they wanted to ask us. They just knew that they had prisoners and they must beat them until they spoke. And that's what we went through. And some of it they lost, you know, they simply beat us because that's what they wanted to do. Some of it they would beat you for not answering a question. Sometimes you'd ask a question and they continue beating you. And so, you know, it was a, it was a surreal and terrifying experience 
because at some point you felt as though you were losing control. And at any point, this could go drastically wrong. And we were lucky to get out the other side. There's no doubt about it. A good question, Norman. OK, thank you. Th thanks for that, Norman. Right. Um, no, no, Andy Johnson doesn't have a video, but asks, how did captivity change you as a person? Excellent question, Andy. Um, I, it changed me. I mean, so first of all, I kind of suffered from post-traumatic stress disorder. Probably still do, 32 years on. Uh, simple things like explode bangs, so fireworks. This is a classic uh, trait of many people who have been in uh, combat in the last 30 years. Fireworks set us off simply because it's an explosion and you, you're kind of ducking and you're not knowing where the fire's coming from. Did it change me as a person? Not, not in any grand way. I made lots of promises uh, when I was in captivity that, you know, I'd been brought up as a Catholic, although I was a lapsed Catholic. I didn't have uh, no religion in me at all, really. But I made promises to our God that I'd be a better person. But those promises quickly go by the wayside when you get out. Um, I probably became a bit more impatient because I was held uh, for seven weeks where you had no control. Uh, so in small ways, it made me a slightly different person, but it didn't change me in any great way, I don't think. Thanks. Right. I'm going to go hop straight to Linda Wedderburn because the, Linda's question nicely dovetails with the previous one. Hello, John. Thank you for your presentation. I wanted to know, having suffered from post-traumatic stress, what age did your recovery the most? Now, Linda, did you say that you had suffered from post-traumatic stress? No, you, you, that's just you me. have. <laughs> Well, so first of all, this is really important. Something, you know, go back to the uh, World War One, and obviously young men or, were executed for having what was then called shell shock or not being able to go on. If you look at some of the experiences that I describe in Lancaster, people were, uh, uh, they were treated terribly if they couldn't fly more missions. You know, they'd be paraded in front of the whole station, have their rank and their medals torn off them and they'd be confined to clean the toilets, literally, for the rest of the war. Uh, and so we had a very experienced psychiatrist who insisted to the powers that be, so he was a wing commander in the Air Force, Lieutenant Colonel equivalent in the Army. He insisted to the Air Force that allowing the prisoners of war to return straight home would be a disaster. We disagreed with him. We wanted to return straight home and we railed against this, but he was absolutely right, Linda. And so we were held prisoner by a psychiatrist in, in Cyprus for three days uh, before we were allowed to return. But he did us a favor and there's no doubt about that because uh, post-traumatic stress is an injury of the mind. Uh, if, you've got, if you've lost an arm in war, you can see that you've lost an arm. If you are badly scarred, you can see that you're badly scarred. And you can understand why that person can't write, can't move, uh, you know, is, um, uh, doesn't want to be seen so much or something like that. If you have an injury of the mind, you can't see it. But you have to understand what that injury of the mind means. And we were all affected in different ways, the classic all the classic indications of post-traumatic stress disorder. And so what helped us was that initial treatment for a few, just a few days of explanation about how we might be affected. And so I wasn't affected probably, or didn't realize for maybe years until, until I began to understand why I was impatient, why I didn't like uh, losing control, why loud noises made me angry or what made me scared. And so all of those things what helped me was that initial uh, help from a psychiatrist, simple help. And interestingly, Dr. Wing Commander Gordon Turnbull, who looked after us, went on to look after the likes of John McCarthy and Terry Waite when they came out of the Middle East after being held captive for five and six years. So, you know, the way that the military dealt with these things changed uh, immensely during the time of our captivity. Great question, Linda. Thank you. Thanks, Linda. Thanks for that. Tony Styles, Tony, do you want to unmute yourself? Good evening, John. Um, what a fantastic um, presentation. Thank you, Tony. My question is, um, when all the dust had settled after you have been released from captivity, did you have any feelings at all about whether the coalition had gone far enough to prosecute Saddam Hussein? 
um, whether the water cuts finished a bit too early? That's, that's an excellent question, Tony. And it's a question that is asked all of the time and one that I deal with in the book. And I use, um, do you remember uh, General Norman Schwarzkopf, Storm in Norman? Yeah. Uh, he wrote, he said, when I, you know, because I'd spoke to him, you sadly, before he died. And he said he thought that the notion that the West was going to in, continue its march to Baghdad and in some way, shape or form imprison Saddam Hussein, put him on trial or whatever, he said would have ended in disaster. It would have ended with the, America in particular being caught in a quagmire uh, of uh, death and destruction. And he was, and the the key point about that is the coalition, and it was a worldwide coalition then, all of the Arab nations, I think almost all of the Arab nations were involved, would never have held with what would then have been America and Great Britain take going to Baghdad to capture Saddam Hussein. And more importantly, when this did happen in 2003, we saw what the result was. So people had been saying by then for 12 years, you should have got all the way. You didn't finish the job. Mrs. Thatcher famously said the job wasn't finished. She was wrong. The job was finished because the job that we were tasked to do, the coalition was tasked to do, was to liberate Kuwait. Nothing else. And we liberated Kuwait. And what happened when Western forces decided that they were going to change the regime? Well, we know it set the Middle East on fire and there are parts of it still burning today. So I think that the coalition did exactly what it should have done, Tony, stopped at exactly the right point, and we did exactly what we were asked to do. Thank you. Thanks very much for that, uh, Tony. Right, okay, let's just... Uh, there's a couple of questions coming that are very similar to each other. Mark Hunt and Brian Matthews have both asked, how did you team up with your pilot with JP? Was it through selection or another method? So there's similar questions coming in from different... Uh, yeah. So we, we, I, I've answered that question more uh, a little bit earlier on, but the reality was that on the squadron, you had uh, the equivalent, you know, kind of, uh, I think it was 36, so the equivalent of uh, 18 crews, uh, but you never flew with the same person. You, you would mix the experience around day-to-day -day training. Uh, in the run-up to the war, the squadron executives got together and chose who would fly together to make up. So on 15 squadron, we had uh, a number of formations that would fly together in conflict. And we had some experienced people all the way down to the least experienced people in that formation. And so you were, you were put together with whoever the boss thought you'd operate the best with. Th thanks for that. Right. So, sorry that I've repeated a question, but as I say, it's, uh, I'm just uh, busy spinning a number of plates here. Um, Michael Dale. Michael, do you want to... Um, uh, you've got an interesting question there. Is that you, Michael? Yes, it is. Hi, John. Hello, how are you? You better tell... You better explain who you are. <laughs> well, I think the question might sort of do that. <laughs> um, first of all, I'm, I'm pleased um, everything that you went through has had a, a sort of positive effect, if you like, on the, the training. Um, you know, that's something good's managed to come out of it, the training and, and what's happened to you. But um, my sort of daft question, if you like, was um, what sort of preparation for Iraqi prison food did Dudley and Barney's camp cook and help? Well, the thing is, Michael, nobody else in the 300 people who are watching will know who Barney is or the camp cooking. So Michael's a scout leader, uh, younger than I am, but he's referring to my old scout troop, the third time out of Ritson Zone, that I was a scout in the 1970s before I joined up. And in all honesty, and this is not a joke, my uh, time in scouting, and I was from a cub at the age of whatever, or six right the way through till I left home in the Northeast and joined up when I was 16, I was involved in scouting. And it was undoubtedly part of what made me in the military and in, you know, kind of in a cell in Baghdad uh, with a dirty, filthy, lice-ridden blanket. Didn't really bother me all that much. I kind of managed to fashion it into a sleeping bag using some of my old scouting skills. So scout in all seriousness, uh, being a scout definitely helped me in the military and absolutely helped me uh, in my in my kind of uh, ordeal in Iraq. There's no doubt about that. Good question, Michael. You're not winning the prize, though. It's too much of an in question. Uh, yeah. Thanks for your question there, Michael. Okay. 
Alan Reid's asked um, a couple of questions, so I'll just I'll just do two of Alan Reid's questions here. Um, John, I believe there were fifty three JP two thirty three sorties flown by the tornado tornado between seventeenth and twenty first of January. What was the impact of those raids on Iraq airfields and the operations of the Iraqi Air Force? Is there evidence that its sortie rate was disrupted? Um, very good question. Slightly answered with uh, our friend uh, Mark, who asked, who was the RAF armorer, who asked a similar question. Um, the, the tornado was designed around this weapon to attack airfields, and there is no doubt at all that they were that in the first couple of days of the conflict they helped to keep the Iraqi Air Force on the ground, which is what it was all about. It was making sure the Iraqi Air Force couldn't get off the ground and come and attack our aircraft or attack our troop concentrations. What, was there any studies done in the aftermath? I mean, there were, there were occasional ones, but we, couldn't, we, we didn't take over the whole country, so we couldn't get to all the airfields that we'd attacked. Were they as effective as they thought they would be? No. But that's because they built their runways on sand instead of clay. Very complex, something that I deal with in the book. But they absolutely were an integral part of the overall camp campaign. Rather like World War One, you can't just look at one section going over the top in one part of a country going to attack one emplacement somewhere else. You have to look at how all of the combat arms work together through the whole campaign. And that's what Tornado and JP two three three did, but it's a good question. Thanks. All right. Okay, Brian, do you want to just um, unmute yourself there? Yeah. Thanks, David. Uh, thanks, John. Interesting chat. Um, I was a rigger at Moreham when the Gulf War was on. Uh, started off. There's no point saying a rigger because nobody else will understand. You have to Air explain what you did. Yeah. Airframes engineer. Um, so I was on Victors at the time when the Gulf War started off, and then after we got rid of all the victors out to the Gulf. I moved on to tornadoes doing the Gulf War mods. A uh, couple of questions. I know we spoke about JP233, but was there any effect on either the uh, JP233 being used or the number of tornado losses? Did either of them change the way the tornado was operated, i.e. from low level going up to medium or high level? And secondly, one of the worst jobs I remember doing was fitting the ram tiles, the radar absorbent material tiles down the intakes. How effective were they? Um, so two questions. How did the tornado's tactics change? Well, they changed markedly, Brian, from, from day one, wrapped right through day three, six, seven, because we lost six tornadoes, but they weren't all to JP233 attacks and they weren't all to low level attacks. But it became apparent after a couple of days that low level operations were not exactly what was needed, but everybody thought they were at first. And so we went to medium level operations. And I go through the process and describe how people were viewing this in the book. And the tornado wasn't designed for medium level operations. Uh, and it, it, you know, it was not effective. But then quite quickly, we started to get laser guided bombs. I didn't. I was sitting on my fat backside in central Baghdad by this point. Um, but, you know, so the tornado adapted all the way for a myriad reasons, not just because of initial losses or two day losses or something like that. How were the radar absorbing uh, uh, tiles in the intakes? I do not know the answer to that. You'd have to ask somebody far more technical than us. But I can guarantee you that a number of radars locked onto us. Um, so I think that they were probably kind of effective is in some ways, but what was more effective is was having the uh, American uh, aircraft and our own tornadoes firing anti-radiation missiles at their sites to keep their heads down than a bit of radar absorbed material did. Because with that massive big square jet, it was a big old target on radar. There's no doubt about it. Good question, Brian. Yeah, thanks, John. Thanks, Brian. Thanks for that. Le Leonard Jenks um, says, please comment on your experience of being interrogated, which is a very open question. Yeah. Yeah, so, um, ju just any, any comments yeah, on that? Sure. Listen, it was a, you know, the interrogation went on for three days. In my case, some people kind of held out for a few hours, some people for a few days, some of the SES guys for eight, nine days, some for even longer. But the, as I alluded to earlier, the bottom line was, 
all of us knew we'd give in at some point, and it was just a matter of time. It was violent, it was brutal. Uh, it was terrifying to be stuck in a, uh, a cell or a basement chained to a, a chair, uh, being beaten, uh, be, be, you know, people hitting you with sticks and clubs and rubber hoses. Um, you know, simple things like just kind of, because you're blindfolded in the dark, kind of moving you around and then standing you somewhere and you don't know that you're standing inches from a concrete wall and smashing your head against a concrete wall. And it's it's more of the kind of the, the sense of not knowing, the sense of utter lack of control, the sense of your life being in somebody else's hands and that they can kill you at any point and nobody would ever know. And so in many ways, it, you, you begin to fear the unknown and you have a fear of fear, which sounds curious, but you don't, you are, you're fearing what's coming next. Is these, are these steps coming down the corridor? Are they going to stop at my cell or are they going to stop at somebody else's cell? And you can hear people screaming as they're being interrogated. Somebody stubbing cigarettes out on somebody. Somebody sent, you know, at one point they put tissue paper down the back of my neck and set it on fire. And so you never know what's going to happen. And that is the worst part about an a phase of interrogation of actual class. It's a good question. Thanks. That's great. Right. OK. Uh, Steve Chambers, tongue in cheek. A tornado GR1 has two seats, front seater or back seater, which has the brains? <laughs> well, anybody who sits in the back seat would talk about the stick monkey in the front seat. That you know, that basically all they do is fly the jet. We operate the jet from the back seat. All the pilot is required to do is fly it. But the guy in the front seat would just say that we're talking ballast. So you can you can choose whoever whoever you want to go with. Thanks for that. Uh, thanks for that, Steve. Right. Okay. Um... Camel Gordon, there's a couple of questions all uh, similar again. So on behalf of several people, off you Campbell's go. Campbell's here. He's yeah. looking at me. Go, go for it. Thank you, John, for a tremendous presentation. It Thank really you. was was outstanding. A quick question for you. Uh, do you and John Peters still stay in touch? Yeah, I mean, we we were, you know, we were mates. Uh, but, you know, we weren't, it wasn't like, you know, possibly Top Gun with Goose and Maverick or whoever the two new uh, compatriots are. Great film, the new Top Gun. Um, so we were mates uh, and we shared a beer together and we kind of hung out together, but we weren't, you know, we weren't tight. We, you know, I had my own group of friends uh, who were single guys in the mess that I went out with much more and my mates from other squadrons uh, who are socialised with much more in actual fact. We still... Uh, we still see each other occasionally. We normally have a reunion every year of all the POWs and we all the POWs get together and we have one quiet beer together and then we follow it up with 10 extremely loud beers together. Uh, but, you know, it, it, it's more of your close friends. So, for instance, on Friday, the tornado force as a whole will get together in London, train strikes allowing. Normally, there's about three or four hundred people there. Uh, I get it'll be smaller this time, but I know that one of my mates watching is going to be there. I haven't seen him for a good few years. And we'll 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 get together and we'll relive old times uh, and we'll natter and we'll drink and we'll celebrate friends and we'll remember friends who never made it. And then we'll go our separate ways and we may not see each other for two years or five years or 10 years. But that's the reality of life in the in the military camp. Great, thank you. Thanks for that. Thank you. Thanks. Adrian, Adrian Smith. Yeah, good evening, uh, uh, John. Thank you very much. Uh, we met, I, I met you briefly at uh, Riyadh about 15 years ago. You were there. Uh, um, I, I bought a book from you and you autographed it kindly. Thank you for a brilliant, brilliant presentation. Yeah, um, my, my question is, um, Obviously, with you know, immense uh, life experience and military experience, what advice would you give to a young person considering joining the RAF now? What, what sort of, which way would you push them in terms of, uh, if like a specialism or trade, if you like? I think that the military today, whether it's the Royal Air Force or anything, is such a completely different beast. You know, when I joined up, so as an airman, we were taking in 140 people a week into the training system, just as an airman. 
And so the, the postings that where you could go, the experience you could have were ast astonishing. Even when I went to be an officer, uh, uh, to going to the officers uh, college at Cranwell, we were taking in another, I think it was 120 or 130 people every six weeks into the training system. We had five or six flying training schools for doing different things. We were pumping through thousands of aircrew a year into the training system, into the and onto hundreds and hundreds onto the front line. Now the Royal Air Force trains 85 pilots a year. That's it. We were training thousands of aircrew a year. Now it's 85. And so I think that anybody who wants to join up now, well, first of all, it's a very different beast. We went through a period of 20 years, over the last 20 years, where if you joined up, you'd know you'd go to war. I think that's probably changed now because I doubt any politician is going to send our armed forces en masse to the likes of Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria. I just don't think that's going to happen anymore. But it's still a great career. But mm. I could never tell anybody what they should do because it's such a different environment now, changed so totally from everything that I knew and everything that I did. Great. Thank, thank you very much, John. Can I just cheekily say thank, uh, hello to Cam? Cam, uh, he and I working on a project for the Western Front, so I'll just say hello to I've, Cam separately. Hello, so, Cam, thank you. again. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks, thanks for your time. Well, super. Thanks for that. Um, Bill Twist um, has previously asked a question, but he's got a, a good one here, so I'm going to just ask this for Bill. Would you do it all again? Very good question, Bill. Um, I'm 59. It all happened 32 years and four stone ago. I'm a bit tubby now to be getting in a tornado, and we don't have any tornadoes anymore, in actual fact. Um, so, would I, I mean, the, the honest answer is I, I, I wouldn't do it now. But the, my military experience was the best experience of my life. I wouldn't change anything that happened to me during the Gulf War, if that answers the question. The Gulf War, for me, is a sliding doors moment. So especially being paraded on TV, it was the worst moment of my life. It was a source of deep shame 32 years ago, and it's still a source of deep shame to me now. So lots of the people watching will remember those pictures, of the TV interview of me being forced to answer questions. 32 years on, I've never watched that video. I've never watched it because for me, it still is a source of, it says failure to me, everything that I did was about failure. So I've never watched that. But in a curious way, it gave me everything that I have. I would never be with you tonight talking about books. I would never be writing my, in the middle of my 18th book, I, you know, I would never be about to publish Eject Eject in three months time. Uh, I would never have met the, the, the lady who became my wife if it hadn't been for those experiences. There was a direct link between those experiences and meeting the lady who became my wife. And so my sliding doors moment was horrendous. It nearly killed me. It killed some of my friends, but it gave me everything that I have today. And for that, I regard myself as the luckiest person to have been involved in that first Gulf War. Super, right. Thanks for that. We're, we're virtually out of time. So apologies to those whose questions I've not got around to. I'm going to ask Rocky just to... Um, ask possibly one, maybe two questions, not, not to okay. extend it beyond half past Dave, nine. But... Dave, just before we do that, David, obviously I've got a prize to give away, David, yeah. so I've been, yeah. keeping tabs, been keeping tabs of the best questions, questions I haven't been asked before, and so I'm going to send the prize, or actually, David, I'm going to, you, you'll get the address sorted out. Don't anybody be putting addresses on, and on screen or anything. We'll sort this out after. So Sandra Taylor, who were asked, I think, the third or the fourth question about the difference between Lancaster navigation and tornado navigation. Uh, I think that because of the, the way that you asked it, I'm going to send you two books, actually, wow. Sandra. I'm going to send you a signed copy of Lancaster and a signed copy of Tornado, and you can compare them both to see uh, which. And I'll get, Dave, I'll get the address off David. We'll sort that out off screen. I, I'll, Sorry, I'll sort that out um, if Sandra wants to email me directly, but otherwise I'll get all of Sandra's details and we'll okay. sort that out post. Well, it'll be tomorrow now. Uh, yeah. Rocky. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, just touching on point you just made there about not watching your the video of yourself. Obviously, most of us did because it was it was a new 
time because it was new because it was 24 hour news now yeah and we the, yeah. the one of the big differences with the gulf war was as it was the watershed from time delayed reporting of i counted them out counted them back in the falklands for example taking hours and hours whatever the next signal trap to people watching being able to watch footage live and i think the the, the question was you know we, we, when you guys were in the gulf uh, and we we've we've all been places and we've all been now watching 24 hour news when we've been on operations but um how how that was taken with the crews because it was new it wasn't this this thing this thing was new now that you can watch 24 hour live and probably more importantly um it's what what the impact was on the families at home because they're, they're very, watching very, it stay up all night watching this yeah, because very good question very yeah. good question Robbie. very good question oh do i get a book uh, <laughs> no 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 um it's a really good question and it's something now so back then there was a slight delay so falklands could be you get news two three four days later in the gulf it was real and there's a there's a little account in the very first uh, uh, bits of the book where because we had tv crews with us uh one of the wives back at RAF law group knew that her husband was on the first raids and she was watching the jets landing in the yeah. morning and some of the crews are getting out, taking their helmets off, and they were being interviewed by the news crews, and her okay. husband wasn't there. And basically, he'd actually landed 10 minutes earlier because he'd had to do something different, but she didn't know that. And when he rang her an hour later to say, I'm home, I'm safe, she absolutely gave him hell for not appearing on the trip. To, for, but she was terrified mm. because he hadn't appeared. It's even worse now. So in, uh, in Iraq and Afghanistan, Information could come out within minutes. And I was in it, uh, I went to Afghanistan oh, a good few years ago now to do a, to meet some of the troops to do a couple of reports. And if a casualty happened, they immediately shut down all communications. They simply shut every communication yeah. to means on base, shut it down. Because what was happening was people were sending, uh, people were sending messages home to say, I'm okay, but Stan's been injured, or God forbid Stan's been killed. And then somebody's wife or partner would then say, oh, my God, I better tell Stan's wife or mum or something. And news was getting out this way before yeah. any official source could get out. And so it's absolutely really vital now that uh, that this kind of thing's controlled. And it really is controlled very tightly. Yeah, I think it works both ways as well. I think the the in 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 the the, the first Gulf War, it was one of those. It was a groundbreaking period. The Berlin Wall had come down. The Cold War was sort of meant to be over. Whole new um, flavor of warfare uh, in the Middle East. Um, but it was not, it's not just the way the news reported. It's how the, the military used the media as well because it worked both ways, wasn't it? But but it was just it was it was it was in your home the whole time. So. Uh, but, uh, but from my perspective, I know Dave is going to sign off. And thanks for us, John. It's been very nice talking to you again. And uh, good luck with the books. Thanks very much, Rocky. All the best. Thanks for that. Yeah. Uh, as Rocky says, we, we, we're there. It's half past nine. And I always promise the, the presenters that we won't go on beyond half past nine. Ralph, so. Ralph, is, wait, Ralph is waiting for it. Ralph, come here. He's waiting for his supper. Look at the book. Well, we, can't, we can't have, we can't have <laughs> Ralph. <laughs> I've been a hungry dog. So <laughs> I'll wrap this up relatively quickly by saying, Everybody, if you've enjoyed this, please raise your hands in the usual way. You pressing the uh, uh, the button on the bottom of uh, Zoom to say thank you very much and a round of applause. Um, so, John, thank you very much. I thoroughly Absolutely. enjoyed. That's been absolutely truly, truly fascinating, uh, brilliant uh, exposition of something that we um, remember. A lot of us remember uh, and, and lived through, which is uh, a stark contrast, perhaps, to to what our usual um, <laughs> webinar is. Finally, once again, John, super evening, thoroughly enjoyed it, and I'll be in touch with you uh, probably tomorrow uh, with, no with details of the prize winner. Lovely. Thanks very much. Good night, everybody. Pleasure being with you. Thanks, Robbie. All the best. You. Bye-bye. Thanks very much, everybody. I hope you've enjoyed it. I know I have. Good night. Thanks again, John, and thanks, Rocky. Mademoiselle.